This video is a ministry of the First Baptist Church, Pampa, Texas. We are located at 203 Northwest Street in downtown Pampa. Join us for worship this Sunday or visit us on our website at firstpampa.org. Now enjoy the rest of the broadcast. Turn in your Bibles this morning with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew uh, chapter 18. We began last week a series that will lead us up uh, into Easter uh, about forgiveness, about how the forgiveness that God gives us breaks the chains that bind us, that control us, that, that constrict us from, from life. You know, Jesus said the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So many people miss out on that abundance because we're, we're restricted, we're confined to a, a decision of our own that's a refusal quite oftentimes to forgive other people or even to forgive ourselves. And that causes us to, to be limited from living out the joy and the fullness and the abundance that God intends for us. See, that's what eternal life is all about. It's not just life after we die and go to heaven, but it's abundant life here and now. Matthew chapter 18, we began by looking at this, this uh, passage. We'll get to verse 21 in just a moment about uh, Jesus' encounter with Peter and the other disciples are there. And, and Peter asks Jesus, how many times do we have to forgive someone? Now, this is not the first question that we find in this chapter. Actually, back in the first verse of the chapter, we find a question that the disciples asked. They said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I think what you'll find and what I want to show, with you, show you this morning is, is in order to properly have a biblical or a grace-oriented perspective of forgiveness, we have to have a perspective that's different from that of the disciples in this chapter. See, the first question, who is the greatest? And the second question, how many times do I have to forgive, are both man-centered, law-driven perspectives on forgiveness. Let me give you an example or an explanation of what I mean by that. Uh, the first question, who is greater, is a question about competition or status or recognition or jealousy. The second question, how many times, is about impatience with man or inconvenience of man. The first question, who is greater, asks, what's in it for me? The second question asks, why me? Why do I have to keep forgiving this person over and over? Both of these are questions of, uh, uh, based or rooted out of a man-centered perspective on forgiveness. So here's the first thought I want you to see is on the screen. Reluctance and refusal to forgive is always because your eyes are on man and not on God. Whenever we say, oh, I can't forgive, or I find it hard to forgive, or I keep on trying to forgive, and we don't seem to ever be able to get past that, it's because our focus is on man, and our focus is on a law-based understanding of forgiveness. And that's what Peter was asking Jesus. He's asking from a law-based perspective. When he said, uh, you know, should we forgive seven times? The reason he asked that is because the, the rabbinical teaching of the law was that they should forgive three times. So what Peter is saying is he, he's trying to stretch it out because remember Jesus always kind of pushed the limit on things. So, so he said seven times and he's kind of patting himself on the back. And I'm sure Peter, we, we know Peter a little bit from reading other passages of him. And, and don't you know Peter's just trying to one-up the other disciples? You know what I mean by, by one up. You know, he's that guy, well, my daddy's six feet tall. Well, my daddy's six five, you know. I mean, he's, that's, that's the kind of guy Peter is, you know. Well, <clears throat> they just asked this question, who, who, who's the greatest in heaven? And as we read the account in Mark and then over in Luke of a similar interaction, uh, we, we find that there, there's competition among them. They've been walking down the road competing with one another. And so when this comes to Peter, he's trying to one up the others by not give an answer of three, but seven times should we forgive. Uh, but we look in this passage and we see that perspective that they have, and it's very man-centered, law-driven in their understanding of what forgiveness is. Last week we talked about the problems 
associated with forgiveness. And at the end of the message, I gave you an acrostic uh, that, that were some practical applications, some practical ways that you can apply, uh, you can practice forgiveness in your life with others. And uh, this morning, I want to, to focus on the perspective required for biblical forgiveness. So if you look with me in Matthew chapter 18, I want to read a long passage of Scripture. It'll be on the screen. There's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, but, but follow along if you don't have a copy of God's Word with you this morning. Beginning in verse 21, Matthew chapter 18. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Or some translations say 70 times seven. It's a, it's a difficult Greek construct, the word here given, but essentially, and, and even scholars will, differ, does it mean seven times or 70 times seven or 700 and, or 490 times? What exactly does that word mean? Here's, here's what it means. Jesus said unlimited. And when he gives this understanding or this explanation of 70 times seven or 77 times, he's saying, uh, no, you shouldn't limit the number of times you ask forgiveness. Continue on verse 23. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man owed him 10,000 talents. A man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he uh, had be sold to repay the debt. Now sometimes we read this stuff, we go, well, that, that's just cruel. You know, this master that's saying, sell him and sell the wife. Remember, it's a parable. Okay, Jesus is telling a story to make a point here. So uh, he, he says uh, that ordered they all be sold to repay the debt. Verse 26, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and, and I'll pay you back. Now, let me give you a little perspective here. This, this man who we first encounter in this parable, the master comes to him and he, he owed, just to help you understand the difference here, he, he owed 10,000 talents. It's as if he owed a million dollars versus this he owed his master a million dollars, whereas this other man who owed him ten denari owed him just a few dollars. Okay, so that's the difference between what the second comparison is and the first figure. The first figure is this massive amount that the master forgives. The second figure, much, much smaller, yet he refuses. And we see in verse 30, it says, but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word, and I thank you for Jesus' use of parables or stories that help us to, uh, to, to grasp, uh, to see a picture of this important, this essential understanding of Christianity, that of forgiveness. Lord, this morning, help us to see the difference between forgiveness required under the law and that which is possible through Jesus, through Jesus Christ and the grace that you so freely gave us. But help us this morning, Lord, to see how this applies to our lives, even now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here, here's what I want to do for you. If you'll listen fast, I, I promise I'll, I'll talk fast. I know I've told you that before, and you usually don't believe me, but I really do mean it this morning. I want to give you three examples of the wrong way to forgive, or three indicators, uh, three uh, evidences, or three concerns, if you will, about forgiveness. And if you identify these things in your life, then your understanding of forgiveness or your practice of forgiveness 
is most likely a man-focused, law-driven forgiveness. But then I want to give you three ways that you can identify or three ways you can practice grace-based, God-focused forgiveness in your life. So here we go. Three concerns that reveal a man-centered, law-driven perspective of forgiveness. As we look at this passage, what Peter has done is he's asked Jesus a a law-driven question. Now, he's wanting a specific answer. And that's what makes it interesting about this word that that even the Greek scholars, and and I'm certainly not one of them, but even Greek scholars differ about how this specific word is to be translated. It's uh, originally the same in the Greek, But translators of some versions of Scripture might call it 77 times, and others might say it means 70 times 7. But here's the point of it, that Jesus is saying when he gives this answer, and it's really referring back to a passage or an encounter in Genesis chapter 4. But when Jesus says, you you shouldn't be limited to the certain amount of times, but your forgiveness should be unlimited. Here's the problem. Have you ever counted the number of times you've forgiven someone? I mean, have you really? Now, now probably, you know, the second time or the third time, or you might say, this person keeps doing this to me over and over, and I've forgiven them a bunch of times. But I, I doubt you're, you're keeping a, a tally list, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and you're, you're marking them off. I doubt you're keeping track of the number of times you've forgiven. And that's really what Jesus is trying to say. He's saying, listen, if you're keeping tally, if you're keeping a track, if you're keeping stats, I mean, you got a clicker like a baseball lump or something, you're keeping track of how many times you've forgiven the person, you've totally missed what forgiveness is all about. See, forgiveness, a law-based, man-focused understanding of forgiveness is something that has a limit, something that is practiced only out of a, a sense of rote responsibility. But something of grace is something that's unlimited. Jesus is trying to convince them. He's trying to show them the difference in in those types of understanding that one is from the heart and one is is absolutely not from the heart, but it's just from uh, a sense of responsibility. There are three indicators or concerns of a law-driven forgiveness that I want you to see this morning. The first, when this is evident in your life, you've not truly forgiven. That's when you have the delight of revenge. The delight of revenge. It's, it's that consuming desire to be punished. Or that consuming desire for them to get what they got coming to them. When you think about that person that's, that's harmed you or hurt you or that's offended you or wronged you in some way, and you go, oh, well, they're going to get theirs. I can't wait for them to get theirs. Then essentially you've not forgiven them. You're holding a, a heart of resentment, a heart of, of offense still against them, and you, against them, and you want them. You're delighted in the fact that they are getting what's coming to them. Then you've not forgiven them. Solomon said, it's found in Proverbs 26, chapter 26, verse 27, uh, he said that that type of forgiveness or the delight of revenge can actually end up punishing you. Listen to this verse, Proverbs 26, 27. It says, The one who digs a pit will fall into it, and whoever rolls a stone, it will come back on him. The one who digs a pit, essentially digs a pit for somebody else to fall into, will himself fall into it. He who rolls a stone, uh, it'll end up coming back on him. What he's saying is that, is that uh, many times that law-driven desire to hurt another person actually ends up becoming punitive towards you. So understand, true forgiveness, grace forgiveness, is not delighting in the revenge that somebody else experiences. Secondly, second concern is a demonstration of resentfulness. A demonstration of resentfulness. Oh, we don't typically walk around and and, uh, proclaim, oh, I still have a resentful spirit towards that person. Or I'm still mad at him. We usually don't do that. But a resentful heart is, is quite often revealed by our cynical and cutting remarks. If you don't believe me, just spend five minutes scrolling through Facebook feed. And you will find somebody who is making some passive-aggressive comment about someone that they're cynical. 
and they're just trying to throw it out there, and they intend, I mean, I'm saying something, and I'm intending it. I might be saying something to Zach, but I'm intending it about Ryan. Now, I'm not on Facebook, so don't go look and see if I've actually done that. But you know what I'm talking about. It's that I'm so, I'm so mad, and we don't want to openly say it, but there's still resentment in our heart. And sometimes our resentment toward one person in one avenue or area of our life is played out by us trying to hurt them in another way. Such as, you know that man that fired me last year from my job? Guess what? His son is on my Little League team this year. Let's wait and see how much playing time he gets. Well, that sounds ludicrous. And we would, we would say, oh, we would never be so childish as to do something like that. Oh, wouldn't we? But that's, that's, I mean, that might be an extreme illustration, but that's how it works out. Because we're holding resentment in our heart about this person that we're somehow going to go full circle around and do something to somebody else that we're hoping indirectly will end up hurting that person that we're mad at. That means you've not forgiven them. So that uh, demonstration of resentfulness, the delight of revenge, those are law-driven, man, uh, man-focused uh, perspectives that show that you really don't understand what Jesus is talking about at all. There's a third way, third concern, if you see this in your life, that you really haven't practiced forgiveness, and that's the demand for repayment. The demand for repayment. That means, listen, I'll forgive you when. If your forgiveness starts out with I'll forgive you when, you're not practicing forgiveness. If you're saying, uh, <clears throat> oh, you know, I know he did this, but he shouldn't get off that easy. You understand that, don't you? It means you're not satisfied with their punishment. So you're still holding something against them. And you're, you're demanding that they repay whatever the debt is. And but here's the key to that. You know good and well, once the, 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 the water's under the bridge, you can't get it back. I mean, once what they did to you, things will never be the same. So for you to say, I'll forgive you when you do this, or I'll forgive you when... You know good and well you have no intention whatsoever of forgiving that person. So the demand for repayment, the demonstration of resentfulness, sometimes hidden, sometimes subtle, sometimes indirect, the delight of revenge. Those are evidences that you've not truly forgiven. And what you need to do is you're thinking about the person who's offended you, and I'm not saying that that's all of you, but it, it could be that when I announced a couple weeks ago I was going to preach on for forgiveness, you thought, oh, good, because I really need this. You know the exact situation that you're struggling with forgiveness. And I don't know what that might be. It might be work-related, family-related. I don't know. It might be the neighbor put their garbage can on your side of the driveway one day, and you're still mad about it. But if you see one of these indicators, one of these concerns that keeps coming up and you still have that a hard attitude, it means you haven't begun yet to understand what grace-based forgiveness is all about. See, that's the second encounter in this parable. The man who had received unlimited forgiveness, just an abundant level of forgiveness from his master, then he in turn uh, will not forgive the smallest debt toward that man that owes him something. In fact, he is more punitive toward him, far more punitive toward him than had ever been considered on the first, in, in the first instance. So he didn't get it. He's man-focused. He didn't grasp the grace-based forgiveness that was given him. So what does a biblical perspective of forgiveness look like? There are three confirmations of biblically-based, Christ-centered, grace-driven forgiveness uh, that I want you to be able to see this morning. But first, I want you to notice that what, uh, what Peter asked Jesus by saying, is seven times enough that a law-based 
limited understanding of forgiveness will never bring about forgiveness. See, what, what God gave the Jewish people uh, in, in the law to understand their shortcomings, to understand their failure in relationship to Him, what the law could never accomplish is fulfilled in grace. Look at this passage, or just jot down the notes if, in your notes, if you will. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Let me read the first part of that for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 says, For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. For what the law was powerless to do, God accomplished by sending Jesus. The law is limited because of our flesh. Jesus fulfilled it through the punishment upon His flesh. Our, our law, our flesh, our ability limited Forgiveness through Jesus and His fulfillment of all these requirements of the punishment that was due makes grace unlimited and forgiveness abundant. So what does that look like for us? It means to have a biblically-based, God-focused forgiveness. It means that biblical forgiveness is without demand for payment. Without demand for payment. It means that you should forgive a person freely. And I know that there are times that we go, well, that's just not fair. Say it with me. You've all heard your kids say it. That's not fair. And my kids, Colby's here this morning. How many times growing up did you ever hear me say, as soon as you begin to understand that life's not fair, you'll be better off for it? You know, we have this understa understanding, this, this fleshly bent that wants to even things out, that wants to force them to repay. That's not grace. That's not grace. There's not one ounce of effort that you could ever do to earn Jesus' forgiveness. Not one ounce. Not one bit. Yet He fully and freely forgives us. Freely for us, but it cost Him everything. You know what that means? It means that there are times that you're called upon to forgive someone, and it might cost you something. It might cost you a lot. It might cost your reputation. It might cost you ever getting repaid. It might, ever, it might cost you uh, correcting your own reputation but at the end of the day understand this your reputation is bigger than one single act realize that a choice or something made by somebody else if your character is consistent and it, it is Godward in its desire it's going to take care of itself but if you truly want to forgive it's got to be without demand for payment the second confirmation of biblical forgiveness is without desire for consequences. Without desire for consequences. It's releasing vengeance to the Lord. You know, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But somehow when somebody hurts us, we feel like it's our opportunity to get them back. It doesn't matter how great or small. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And if you biblically want to forgive someone, it's got to be without desire for consequences. And that doesn't mean that a person who does something, breaks the law, whatever, should not face consequences. There are punitive consequences that we have in this world that are appropriate. And we find that in in uh, the master's reaction uh, to this man when he heard about how uh, the, his servant did not forgive the one who owed him the lesser amount, then what the servant, the last, he said, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. He said, no, you'll be punished if you refuse to forgive. There'll be a punitive thing. So, so punishment, consequences, those things are true. But it's not your responsibility to bring those punishment, those consequences about. So you need to trust 
the Lord in that, let the legal system or let others, let responsibility take care of that. But if you're harboring within yourself a desire for consequences, you've not truly uh, forgiven the person. Thirdly, third confirmation of biblically-based, Christ-centered, grace-driven forgiveness is without delay in reconciliation. Without delay in reconciliation. The Bible says, verse we talked about last week, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Be at peace with all men. You know, when we, when we stubbornly refuse to forgive someone for their sin against us, and we say, well, I'm not forgiving them, then what we're saying is really a revelation more of our own heart than of their action. Let me say that again. If we stubbornly refuse to forgive another person for what they've done for us, to us, it's more revealing of our heart's condition than it is of their action. 2 Timothy 3.5 talks about one that has a form of godliness but denies its power. As a Christian, if we forgive, uh, refuse to forgive someone, essentially that's a picture of us. We're saying, yeah, the gospel's good enough to forgive me, but it's not powerful enough for me to forgive that person. And for us to behave in that manner, to refuse to forgive, is just as if we have a form of godliness, but we're denying its power. Look at, look at the next uh, phrase or quote on the screen. There may be no greater test of our faith or no greater proof of our witness than how we live in relationship with others. There may be no greater test of our faith. Here's the deal. If there's that person, that situation that you say, I will not ever forgive, then you better check your own faith. If your heart is that hard against another person, have you genuinely received God's forgiveness of you. It's a test of our faith. Why is life so hard? Life would be great if it weren't for all the people we had to put up with, wouldn't it? It tests us. It tests, are we really trusting the Lord? If we're trusting the Lord for our forgiveness, if we're trusting the Lord for our salvation, then we're going to live that out by seeking reconciliation with other people. That's what it means, living in relationship with others. Uh, look at the next verse that will be on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm just going to read a portion of this, but it's verse 18 and 19. It said, All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he has made us agents, messengers of reconciliation. God was in Christ personally reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and he has commissioned us with the message of reconciliation. You can't say you're reconciled with God, yet ref ref refuse permanently to forgive another person. When we receive the grace of God, it changes our heart. It changes the way not only you see God, it changes the way you see yourself, and it changes the way you see others. Grace received is to be grace extended. Some of you watched, as I did this past week, the funeral of Dr. Billy Graham. If you haven't watched it, Take about 75 minutes of your time and go to billygraham.org and watch it. It's, it's powerful. It's, a, it's an amazing testimony of what God does with a simple man who's fully yielded uh, to the power of God in his life. But as I watched, and there were some key things that I really was, uh, thought were terrific, the music and, and the, the messages there was probably no more powerful moment than the testimony of Ruth Graham, one of his daughters. 
that told her story. And i am not been familiar with all of Billy Graham's children, really, and that's fine. I mean, I just haven't been a Billy Graham historian and, and known about all of them. I've been familiar with a couple of them. But her story I'd never, uh, never really heard. And she began to, to say this. She said, a number of years ago, a long-time marriage she was in uh, failed. And then she married again against her father and her family's desires and wisdom and counsel and so forth. And in a short period of time, that second marriage failed. And in that time, she turned against God. In that time, she, she began, to, began to make choices that were, were not right, not God-honoring. Well, a time came when she knew she had to go see her parents. She was living in Seattle. Said she made a long two-day drive to North Carolina to them, not knowing the whole time and wondering the whole time what would her family's reaction be to her. And I don't know if it was her or one of the other sisters said, you know, it's one thing you don't want to disappoint your father, but then you really don't want to b disappoint Billy Graham. But she, she just had this fear, not knowing what was going to happen. And she knew. She knew that her choices were wrong. She knew that she had sinned against God. She knew that she had not honored her family. She said she made that long drive home, and, and their home is on the side of a mountain. She said as she... As she wound around and got up to the house, she approached the house, and there was her father standing outside waiting on her. And you just, you just see this picture of the prodigal son being lived out. And she said she, she got out, approached her father, and his words to her were, Welcome home. That's grace. Never did he say, I told you so. Never did he say, you should have listened to me to start with. Never did he say, now because of what you did, here are the consequences you're going to have to deal with. She knew all those things. Don't we know all those things when we sin against God? But what does he do for us? He extends his arms and says, welcome. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, heavy laden, Come to him and he'll give you rest. You know, I don't know that there's anything more burdensome than being in a broken relationship with another person and being in a broken relationship with God. It causes sleepless nights. It causes stressful days. It causes an unease and a continuing torment that you just can't work yourself out of it. But he says... Come unto him, and he'll give you rest. Will you bow your heads with me for a moment?